Today we are in the State House cafeteria um, examining, uh, having a good look at the uh, January show that we have hanging here. Really interesting show called The Endangered Alphabets Project. Um, this is a show by Tim Brooks, who's the director of uh, pr the professional writing program at Champlain College, as well as the editor in chief of the uh, Champlain College Publishing Initiative. Uh, he's the founder of The Endangered Alphabets Project. He was an NPR essayist for 20 years, and he's the author of 16 books. Uh, he's a gentleman who's put a tremendous amount of time and energy into this, and he created all the pieces that are here in the cafeteria. And I think um, it's best f for me just to kind of read a sense of what he's written about the show and why it's so important. Um, so in, in the world today, we have more than 6,000 languages, but thanks to the forces of globalization, half will probably be extinct by the end of this century. Yet this loss of cultural diversity is even more dramatic in terms of the alphabets, the organized symbols in which those languages are written. Uh, writing has become so dominated by a small number of global cultures that those 6,000 languages are written in only about 160 alphabets, which is pretty astonishing. Uh, the Latin alphabet, which is basically the ABC of the West, has gone from being the alphabet of military empire to the alphabet of economic empires and most recently of the Internet. Uh, and on a global scale, writing is already dominated by as few as five major alphabets. Um, uh, at least 110 of the world's 160 alphabets are endangered, meaning they're no longer taught in schools, no longer used for government or commerce, written and read by only a few elders, restricted to monasteries, or used only in magic spells or secret love letters, he mentions. Um, if something is important, we write it down. And, and when a culture, usually a minority or indigenous culture, is forced to adopt another writing system, uh, then within two generations, everything they've written for hundreds or even thousands of years, things like sacred texts, poems, personal correspondence, legal documents, um, the collective experience, wisdom and identity of its people is lost. And the Endangered Alphabets Project, um, which is a, a Vermont-based nonprofit that uh, Tim Brooks has created, is the first ever attempt to bring attention to this issue. So if you come to see the show, you'll, you'll see, uh, as he notes here, that most of the carvings in the uh, exhibition are translations of Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So almost everything you see here in these endangered languages is saying the same thing, which is that all human Human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They're endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Uh, and he notes that the sad irony is that these extraordinary writing systems and the cultures that develop them are endangered precisely because people have not acted toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Uh, and there are certainly some cultures that are trying to preserve or revive their alphabets, and this project that Mr. Brooks has come up with uh, is an attempt to try to help with that. Uh, and he also has a, a website that's starting to come online that's interactive that's really interesting as well called endangeredalphabets.net. Um, so I would certainly encourage folks to come and look uh, along with each of the, the wooden pieces here, which Tim Brooks did create himself. There is um, some writing, uh, some text associated with it that talks about uh, what the language is and a little bit of the history and, and where and, and uh, in what capacity it's still used today. Um, also, on um, this, this show is going to hang for the entire month of January, uh, but this Thursday, so January 17th, so today, as you're viewing this, um, from 4 to 6, there's going to be an artist talk and reception in the cafeteria, uh, open to the public for anyone to come. Uh, there will be a specific talk by Tim Brooks about this project and about his process, along with Lieutenant G uh, Governor David Zuckerman that will run from 4.30 to 5.15. There will be food, there will be refreshments, um, and it's a great opportunity to come in and, and uh, meet with Tim Brooks and learn a little bit more about this project. It's really important and, and really enlightening for people. Uh, if you're not able to make the reception, again, the show should be up here for another two or three weeks until the end of the month and uh, we would certainly strongly encourage you to try to come in and take a look at it because it's very different than uh, a lot of the shows that we do hang here in the cafeteria and it's a really important topic and really is an eye-opening um, experience to, to see and learn a little bit about this. Hello, I'm Dick McCormick. I represent Londonderry, Mount Holly and all of Windsor County in the Vermont Senate. And uh, I originally was uh, sworn in in 1989. I did leave for four years, but otherwise I've been in the Senate since. And uh, this year I will again be on the Health and Welfare Committee in the morning. You get two committees in the Senate, Health and Welfare in the morning 
and uh, power the powerful appropriations committee in the afternoon. Uh, I must say we don't feel particularly powerful over the last few years because um, the people of Vermont have been pretty clear that they do not want to pay anything more in taxes, which you have to understand and respect. But it does mean that we are left with a um, fixed amount of money and um, new money is, is just is a pipe dream and that means that at dealing with uh, ex added, added expenses to things is quite difficult. Uh, nevertheless, we muddled through, and I expect we'll do it again this year. We're in somewhat better shape than we have been in other years. At the beginning of the legislative session, the first uh, order of business in the Appropriations Committee is um, the Budget Adjustment Act. We are in the middle of the FY19, fiscal year 19, uh, fiscal year, uh, which will end um, the end of June and then the new fiscal year begins. And as to be expected, um, we don't have uh, fortune tellers. We make reasonable, logically defensible projections into the future, but in inevitably, by the time you're in the middle of the fiscal year, uh, it's necessary to make some corrections. And a lot of the correct, some of the corrections have been because in, in recent years, uh, we've come up $40 million short of what we thought we were gonna have, and the budget adjustment involves finding forty million dollars of spending that we're not going to do. Um, there were years years ago when it was the opposite where the question was okay what are we going to do with this surplus. What we are dealing with uh, this year is that uh, it looks as though the projected revenues are about where they were expected to be. There's still a budget adjustment act. For one thing a lot of, our, a lot of it are book keeping changes which come from the administration. Uh, you, you drop this expenditure and then that money is made up from some other source. That's pretty complex. Uh, even though I'm on the powerful appropriations committee, I feel very much like a, a freshman economic student sometimes. Uh, but I, that's the fact is we have a citizen legislature and we have very good attentive uh, um, uh, accountants to help us with that. On health and welfare, uh, I do want to make one comment. I have recently, personally, had a, um, a total knee replacement, and which is in, not insignificant. It's surgery. I also had some post-surgical complications, and uh, I have. I'm very impressed by how differently, this is one man's story, just one man, but at least in my case, how differently pain has been managed with this surgery than in some surgeries I had had just a few short years ago. A few years ago, pain management for me was almost entirely opioids. And then after a while, you would get weaned off onto um, Tylenol. This time, the pain management was entirely Tylenol with the option of adding an opioid occasionally as needed if the Tylenol just didn't do the trick. And I must say I had better pain management with less of a reliance on opioids this time. And I have been worried all along. I've supported all of our, of our uh, bills to tighten up on prescription. But I've always expressed anxiety that we might be creating an unintended consequence of making it more difficult to alleviate pain. And I gotta say, as, the, as probably someone who worried about that more than anyone in the, in the legislature, that I'm very impressed with how, how well it's being handled. Um, the great overarching issue, of course, I mean, we're also, I'm, I'm a Democrat in the Senate, so I'm, I'm, we'll be working with the Democratic caucus on things like uh, minimum, raising the minimum wage, uh, family leave, those are important issues. But the overarching issue of our time really is global warming. And it is dismaying uh, that people have slipped. I think we've gone from one kind of denial to another. Uh, we were dealing for years with people who simply insisted that the scientists all over the world are wrong and uh, there actually is not a problem with global warming. Though That kind of denial has really been um, pushed to the margins. Someone starts talking like that, people try to find a polite way to get out of the room. They're dealing with a nut. But what we have is a different kind of denial, which is, yes, global warming is a problem, but we don't want this solution, it might cost some money, that solution will be inconvenient, as though 
dealing with global warming were a, a preference. It's not a preference, it's an existential necessity. Um, but having said that, I also understand the opposition to a, a carbon tax. I like the idea that you get rewards for doing the right thing and that maybe it's a little harder to do the wrong thing. But as uh, Speaker of the House uh, Johnson has put it correctly, it doesn't seem fair or even rational to essentially punish people for driving instead of using mass transit when there is no mass transit. <laughs> I mean, what are they supposed to do? So I'm delighted that my little brother, Kurt McCormick, has been appointed chair of House Transportation because this is a lifelong advocate of mass transit and muscle transit, bicycle and walking. And I think that probably providing alternatives to driving is, is something that we really want to do before we start trying to affect driving habits. And I say that as, as someone quite concerned about global warming and someone who has always thought that at least if we can address the regressivity of a carbon tax that we should have a carbon tax. And uh, I think that the best way to address the regressivity is to understand it is poor people who are driving long distances to work in gas guzzlers because that's all they can afford and that they should be provided with some alternative. And uh, exactly what that will look, look like I don't know. And uh, a lot of people say well in the Senate, Senator Maz has always been sort of a, an old boy with traditional views. But the fact is, we, we would not have um, Amtrak in this state without Senator Maza. Uh, he is a guy who, who I, for one, have always been able to reason with. Speaking of which, I'll also say I had the honor of being freshman state senator Phil Scott's first committee chair. And I know that Phil Scott can drive a hard bargain but he can be reasoned with and he can be negotiated with and uh, he and I worked together well when I was chair of, of his committee and uh, the people of Vermont in their wisdom have elected an overwhelming democratic progressive legislature and a Republican governor that means one of two things it means the people of Vermont don't have a clue what they want or it means they want us to work together. They see value. They hear value when they hear the governor speak. They hear value when they hear people like me speak. And they say, okay, you both got good points. Make this work. And that's, it's a challenge. It's easier, easier said than, than done. But I believe uh, we can do that. We are, first of all, I will tell you, having, again, mentioning that I had had surgery recently and having been out for a while, um, Coming back to this place, I am reminded I am good friends, not only with people I agree with. I have a lot of people I disagree with about everything, and we're friends. And I think we will work together as friends, and we'll, we'll muddle through. So, thanks. No one has ever complained that I didn't speak long enough, so I'll sign off. Bye. I'm John Kalaki. I'm the new representative in South Burlington, Shitton 73, in the House here, in uh, the People's House, in the House of Representatives in Vermont. Uh, this is my first term. It is an extraordinary privilege and honor to represent uh, my colleagues in South Burlington here in the state, and it's been an extraordinary, this is my second week. So it's been an amazing learning process. I came from the nonprofit world. I ran the Flynn Center here for eight years, but there's a lot of new learnings here. I just spent a very profound couple of hours uh, listening to people who work with the homeless community in our state and uh, from the lived experience of people that have experienced homelessness to some of the advocates and some of the extraordinary people working to provide home housing and safety for everyone in Vermont. It uh, will be part of my committee work. I'm on the General Military Affairs and Housing Committee. So we do a lot of things. The National Guard certainly is on people's minds right now. We'll be uh, with the whole House and Senate be, uh, of course, choosing the new leader of the National Guard in uh, later November. So that's already uh, in play. Living wage will be, of course, revisited. Um, as will paid family leave, those will come uh, also parts of through the general um, committee that I serve on. There's a lot of talk about moving marijuana to the retail component, what we're going to do with that and how we tax and regulate that. That will be something that is going to be bouncing around to many committees. I look forward to those issues as well. It's a 
an amazing thing as a citizen legislature to be seated with 150 other people in the House and we're all learning together, we're all growing together, we're thinking together. The way the bills are being put in, there's multiple bills at different layers being introduced. Uh, I'm looking at those, I'm co-signing on certain bills that seem right for both uh, what I believe in and also for people in South Burlington as well as Vermonters. So there's an extraordinary, uh, like, information just keeps, this crescendo of it, it just keeps coming and it's, it's beautiful. And I'm having a great time and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to serve Vermont. Hello, I'm Allison Clarkson. I'm a senator for the Windsor County District. And uh, in addition to being vice chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs and a clerk of government operations, I also serve in the State House as the producer of Farmer's Night. And Farmer's Night is a free series in the House chamber every Wednesday night at 7.30. Uh, and it showcases the incredible talent that we have here in Vermont. Uh, we're beginning tonight, tonight's Wednesday, January uh, 16th and we begin tonight with the 40th Army Band doing a wonderful concert uh, next week on uh, January 23rd the Vermont Symphony Orchestra will be here all farmers nights are free and open to the public in the house chamber at the State House now through the beginning of April except for town meeting week uh, you can check out the schedule on the Vermont legislative website and we welcome you we'd love to have you come Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Intochka. I'm a state representative from Charlotte, part of Hinesburg, and I'm on the, energy, uh, the House Energy and Technology Committee. Um, my committee has purview over the uh, energy policies of the state of Vermont, as well as uh, telecommunication policy and uh, the overview of the IT infrastructure of the state. Um, my primary focus, I, I believe, in this uh, session is going to be addressing climate change issues. Uh, we have seen an increase in greenhouse gas emissions over the last uh, 10 years, uh, where we should be seeing reductions. And the increases are coming, while, we, while we've uh, done a pretty good job of getting renewable, clean renewable energy uh, in our electric grid, uh, the primary greenhouse gas emissions are coming from transportation and heating. So it is my hope that during this uh, legislative session we can do something to seriously address these greenhouse gas emissions to drive them down and that's going to take uh, increased efforts at weatherizing homes, low and moderate income homes, and uh, tr converting our transportation to uh, more mass transit as well as uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. So uh, that's, that's an effort that I'm going to be focused on. Uh, we also, in order to uh, achieve, to, to encourage economic development throughout the state, we need uh, more broadband, high-speed internet in our rural areas. And um, that is another uh, challenge that Vermont has. Uh, Again, it takes money, and uh, we have to find the money to do this. So if we want economic improvement, job growth, we're going to need to find it in uh, our broadband, through our broadband, and also through our uh, climate initiatives. So thank you very much. Hello, I'm Representative Ann Donahue. I represent Northfield and Berlin, and this year I've just been reappointed as vice chair of the House Health Care Committee. Um, we are, of course, uh, just getting started. We actually have five of our 11 members who are new to the health care committee or brand new in the legislature. So right now, we haven't taken up any issues yet. Um, we're really trying to bring everybody up to speed with sort of a baseline of knowledge of how our health care system as a whole works in Vermont. And there are a lot of complicated components, everything from how the health insurance market works, uh, how we oversee all the components of the system, um, and what the needs are. 
But I want to discuss briefly an issue that's of real concern uh, to Berlin and the other towns that uh, are involved in um, school consolidation questions uh, in that area because it's a big one. Uh, most people are aware that a few years ago the legislature um, passed a merger uh, bill to increase some, to some extent efficiencies. I believe the real focus, um, the reason I supported it in the end, uh, was about equal access of opportunity for our students. Uh, that we didn't have a child in one community who had access to all sorts of foreign languages, for example, and another community who had none. And so by creating larger districts, we would increase that access. The focus was, can we get communities to work together to sort out uh, who would be best merger partners and how to create those larger districts. But ultimately it was about a requirement that these mergers occur. So by the end of this uh, several year time frame, those who had not merged um, could potentially be subject to a required merger um, agreement under the Board of Education. And that's the point we've gotten to and some of those remaining communities are uh, very upset uh, about being mandated and in fact even gone to court. Um, and so I look as a representative at my town at Berlin and saying should they be allowed to be treated differently from those who did merge um, and why? And I think the question we need to look at in the legislature is did we set up a system that appropriately balances uh, the input of the communities with the goals uh, of the merger initiative. Um, I don't want to see a change that uh, treats communities who did agree on merger processes even though they didn't necessarily like them um, and therefore deal with them unfairly and these remaining towns getting some special advantages at having it their own way. But on the other hand, uh, if they have unique circumstances where they really have thought through the alternatives, which I think Berlin and those surrounding towns did, um, did we give adequate weight in our process to um, their alternative proposals? Uh, so I think we do need to look at that this year. I'm very supportive of the need uh, to relook at those remaining communities and whether we have the correct uh, mechanisms for addressing those needs in the context of a statewide goal. And it is a statewide issue, not a local community driven issue, because we fund education through a statewide system. So other people's dollars are going to your school. They have a right to um, a statewide process of saying those dollars are. Um, equally creating opportunities for all of our students. So it isn't just about local control. There is a, a really important statewide um, policy um, that, that matters. Um, so we do need to relook at it, um, but I'm not on a bandwagon that says these communities that didn't come up with a merger plan should be allowed to do what they want um, without having to comply uh, with um, participating in this effort to create more consolidated districts. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Beck. I'm a representative in the Vermont State House of Representatives um, and I represent St. Johnsbury. Uh, this is my third term. My first two terms I was in the uh, House Education Committee. Um, this session I'll be in the House Ways and Means Committee which is a um, uh, it's, a, it's a different committee obviously and there will be a lot of differences but um, there will be a lot of similarities too because House Ways and Means uh, dwells into education funding and finance and, and that of course is something that we were very interested in in House Education. So I'm looking forward to the work. Um, I'm finding out that there are uh, un not unexpectedly a lot of things about uh, taxation and fees in Vermont that I was not aware of before but um, I'm, I'm studying and learning quickly getting up to speed as quickly as they can and hopefully make some decisions that will benefit Vermonters.